not used to using a PC. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and uh, I'm a resident of Silicon Valley. I live a few miles from here. A uh, little bit about my background. I work for Apple. I was Apple's uh, software evangelist uh, the first time I worked at Apple. Second time I worked at Apple, I was Apple's uh, chief evangelist. And then I went on to start some software companies. I started a company called Garage.com, which was a uh, early stage investment bank and venture capital firm. Uh, today I'm primarily a writer and a speaker. Uh, I have written 12 books. This is my 12th book. And um, I'm just very happy to be here. Uh, today was a big day in my life because uh, in the morning I recorded for MSNBC and then I did a Google Plus Hangout on air with Joe Biden about gun control. And I just recorded uh, for NPR radio, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. Uh, it's a very funny radio show. So I was just a guest on Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me. And then to cap off the evening, I'm here for tech. So, uh, and then at lunch, I played hockey too. So it was just a, you know, all around good day today. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. I'm going to whip through this presentation about how to publish a book. Uh, and then we'll get to a Q&A and a fireside chat, okay? Okay, so um, let me tell you the story of my current book. Uh, two books ago, I, I wrote something called Enchantment. And this was a book that explained how to enchant people, to influence and persuade them. And towards uh, the end of the project, I got this speech. And part of the speech was that the company agreed to buy 500 copies of the ebook version of Enchantment. So I was really happy that this sale came through and I contacted my publisher and I told them and uh, to my utter amazement they told me that they could not sell 500 copies of the ebook. They always have to use a reseller. Okay, so I tell the uh, person at this company who's going to buy the 500 books that she has to go to Apple or uh, Amazon or Barnes & Noble. And so first she goes to Apple and she buys uh, the book, but she can only buy them one at a time. And, and so she buys about 10 and then she gets a warning message that you cannot buy any more because, I don't know, they're afraid of people trying to stack the bestseller list or something. So they, they stopped her from buying the book. She talks to Apple, explains what she's doing, and they say, well, the best we can do is let you buy 500 copies, one at a time, you get the promo code, and you send it to people. So that was a non-starter. So she then contacted Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, and everybody told her the same thing. So I was utterly amazed that, you know, as short as two years ago, you could not sell 500 copies of an ebook. I was just amazed. And so simultaneously, right about then, I fell in love with Google Plus. And to me, Google Plus is the Macintosh of social media. And let me explain what I mean. So with Macintosh, I think that Macintosh is better, used by far fewer people, and the experts for many years said that Macintosh would fail. Google Plus, I think, is far better, used by far fewer people, and the experts said that it would never take off. So to me, it was like deja vu that Google Plus was like Macintosh, and when I encountered Macintosh the first time, I wrote a book called The Macintosh Way, so it seemed logical that I should write a book about Google Plus, so I wrote this book called What the Plus. So, and, and because I wrote this book, I decided I was going to self-publish this because I wasn't going through this madness where a publisher would not let me sell it the way I wanted to. So when I published What the Plus, I learned how difficult it was to self-publish a book. I thought it would be very easy. You just write it in Word, you upload it to Kindle, and you know, boom, everything is great. Well, that may be true for novelists, but for a nonfiction writer with pictures and captions and tables and footnotes and lists and bulleted lists. Uh, it's a real, real challenge to self-publish a book. So that led me to write this book, Ape. So this is how to publish a book based on what I learned, self-publishing What the Plus, which is based on being forced to sell 500 copies of an ebook one line item at a time. So that's the genesis of Ape. So I, I use a top 10 format for my speeches. Uh, this is because I've been in the Valley for about 30 years and I've seen many, many high-tech speakers and most of them suffer from two fatal flaws. 
Fatal flaw number one is they suck as speakers. Uh, I can see you've seen the same people I have. Uh, fatal flaw number two is they go long. And if you think about that, that's a bad combination. You know, if you suck and your speech is short, okay. And if you're great and your speech is long, it's okay. But if you suck and go long, it's like being stupid and arrogant. You know, it's, it's just a bad combination. And so what I do is I always use a top 10 format. So this is my top 10 format for how to publish a book. Um, the first thing, if you're considering writing a book, I would like you to review the, the motivation you have for writing a book because I think it should be pure. First, let me discuss the wrong reasons to write a book. Number one is to make money. It is unlikely you'll make a lot of money writing a book. Uh, just statistically, very few authors do this. So your motivation should not be to make money. If you write a great book, you will make money. But if that's what's motivating you, it's unlikely that you will write a great book. Two other bad motivations. One is, I want to write a book, position myself as an expert, so I get more consulting gigs. And the third bad reason is, I want to write a book, I want to position myself as an expert so I can get more speeches. Um, what I want you to do is think of yourself as a reader. And as a reader, when you go to Barnes & Noble or you go to Amazon.com and you see books by Clayton Christensen and Jeffrey Moore and Bob Sutton and Malcolm Gladwell and you know all these great nonfiction business writers, and then you see your book, okay? Your book is called The Schmo Way. It's by you, Joe Schmo. And it's published by Schmo Press. I want you to ask yourself, well, why would anybody give a shiitake about my book? There's Malcolm Gladwell's book. It's going to teach me how to tip, right, or how to blink and make a decision. And Clayton Christian's book is going to show me how to, you know, master the innovator's dilemma. And Jeffrey Moore is going to show me how to cross the chasm. And my book is going to be the Schmo way. So why should anybody care that your book exists? That is a very good test. The right reasons to write a book are, first of all, to enrich people's lives, that you really have something to say that they will consider valuable. Secondly, is to further a cause like Rachel Carson wrote the book Silent Spring and furthered the cause of environment. And finally, to meet an intellectual challenge. That is, you always wanted to write a book. It's on your bucket list. I think this is a fine motivation. So number one is write for the right reasons. You want to enrich people's lives, you want to further a cause, or you want to cross something off your intellectual bucket list. Number two, I strongly suggest that you use Microsoft Word. Now, there are cheaper word processors. There are open source free word processors. There's all kinds of ways around this. But I'll tell you, at the end of the day, you want to use Microsoft Word because it has one very powerful feature, which is style sheets. So you can fix the style of a paragraph, the font, the indentation, the spacing, all that kind of stuff. Then you can fix, after you type a carriage return, after that paragraph, automatically what will be the next paragraph. And so what you want to do is have a totally organized manuscript where everything is a style. Because when you import that into the layout program, the layout program wants to see styles. You don't want to be formatting your book in the layout process. It should be formatted in the word processing process. So that's one reason to use Word is style. The second thing is it is a standard, like it or not. And as a standard, you will be sending your manuscript to editors, to testers, to designers and resellers. Everybody standardized on Word. This is not a battle worth fighting for. I don't care what you think about Microsoft. I know you can do things cheaper. This is not about you. This is about what's going to happen down the line. Um, some of you may say, well, you know, all these word processors, Pages and, and LibreWriter and OpenWriter and all these things all say they can save as Word. And I'll tell you from first-hand experience, Microsoft Word cannot even save properly as Microsoft Word. Okay? So it's unlikely that any other third-party word processor is going to save properly as Word. Use Microsoft Word. This is not a battle you need to fight. You have better battles to fight. Number three, you should write every day. Write every day. That's what it takes. You know, a lot of people think that the writer's life is you're sitting on a 
windswept beach. You're overlooking the beach. You have parchment paper. And you have these thoughts in your brain and they're going to flow down through your neck, down your shoulder, through your arm, to your hand. And your hand is holding a Mont Blanc fountain pen with an 18 karat gold nib. And the thoughts are going to flow onto the page and then you're going to send this manuscript to your editor who's going to drop everything and for the first time in her career is going to love everything you've written, rush it through the process. There's going to be this amazing cover designer who's going to give you 12 great covers to pick from. They're going to get it out in two months. Your publicist is going to get you on you know, Oprah. She's going to get you on 60 Minutes. Is going to get you in the New York Times and the Washington Post. And if you have any, any delusion that any part of that story is true, I need to break that bubble for you right now. That is not what it's like. Writing is painful. The best metaphor I've ever found for writing is that you are opening up a vein and you are pouring your blood onto the page. That's a classic metaphor. A metaphor that I would tell you I use is, for me, the writing process is I spend about two months outlining a book. I get feedback on the book and then once the outline is done, I go through what I call the vomit stage. And in the vomit stage, I'm basically retching out words as fast as I can onto the page. I'm just trying to spit everything out. The outline, the architecture is set. I just try to spit it out as hard and fast as I can. Then I spend another six months refining the vomit. I'm picking out the big chunks of undigested food. Okay? <laughs> so that at the end, you wind up with pure nutrients. <laughs> That's the writing process. So, to get on with this slide, you need to write every day. There are three things you need to do every day. You need to love your children. You need to floss your teeth and you need to write. Okay? <laughs> write every day. Number four, you need to build a marketing platform. Many authors believe that they write a book, it's so great it's going to automatically sell. That is a delusion. It never happens that way. That's why APE has APE, author, which is writing, P, which is publishing, laying it out, and E, which is entrepreneuring or marketing and selling the book. That stage, the third stage, is the hardest. Many people believe the hardest is the authoring part. It's not true. It's the, it's the entrepreneuring part. And so as a mental model, I'd like to offer you NPR. NPR provides great content every day. Wait, wait, don't tell me. This American Life, Fresh Air, Tech Nation, you name it. Great content, okay? Every once in a while, and I think it began today again, there is an NPR telethon. Nobody likes the telethon. How many of you listen to NPR? So every once in a while they run the telethon, right? It's not like you look forward to the telethon. You tolerate the telethon. Sometimes you may even donate money because of the telethon. And why do you do that? You do that because NPR has earned the right to advertise to you, to promote to you, to run the telethon. They've earned that right because they have provided such great content all year long. You should feel a sense of reciprocation that NPR has been providing such great content for free without any advertising. They have earned the right to run the telethon and I should donate. That is the NPR model. I want you to embrace that for building your marketing platform. Think of yourself as NPR and what you are trying to do is you're trying to be a curator. You're trying to find great content for what are your, whatever your genre is. If you're a mystery and thriller, find great content about mystery and thrillers. Find great stuff about forensic science. Find great stuff about murders and all this kind of stuff. Spy novels, all this kind of stuff. Curate great stuff. You want to build credibility that you understand the mystery and thriller genre. And then you want to send it out on Google Plus and LinkedIn and Facebook and Twitter and Pinterest. You want to build a following who believe in you. And finally, you become a sector expert so that the day you ship your book, you have a built-in audience who will buy your book because they've been reading your great curated content for the past six or nine months and now they are convinced that you really understand the genre so your novel, your book must be good. Build your marketing platform. Number four. Number five is to keep things simple, you could simply start with a Kindle ebook. 
just do a Kindle ebook. Amazon for me is about 75% of the action. And so with one vendor, one ebook, you could cover most of the market. I'm not saying you shouldn't do Kobo and Google Play and Nook and iBooks and iTunes, but if you wanted to keep things simple, start with Amazon. If your book is successful with Amazon, going to the other platforms will make it more successful. But if your book is not successful with Amazon, it's hard to imagine your book will be successful in an overall sense because you went to the other smaller platforms. You have to make it on Amazon and then you'll make it everywhere else. This can keep your life simple. Number six is you should not be afraid of tapping the crowd. Um, I tapped the crowd three times in the process of writing the book. First, after the two months of writing an outline, I asked uh, five million of my closest friends to go to a Google Doc and look at the outline, tell me what they see is wrong with the outline, where they would like me to change the outline. So that happens, I take another month to incorporate all that feedback. About six months go by, now the manuscript is done. And I send another message to my five million closest friends on social media and I say the manuscript is done, I would love to get people who want to volunteer to edit. Copy edit, content edit. And what I do is I ask people to go to a website to provide some background information and then um, I send them the full Word document. So I send them the full manuscript. And if you were to ask a traditional publisher, can I send my manuscript to 250 total strangers that I never met who are in you know, Kazakhstan and, and Croatia and Peru and Chile and Guadalajara and you know, no, I don't even know who they are. Would you allow me to do it? No traditional publisher will let you do it. They'll say you're going to get pirated, it's going to be on BitTorrent, your book will be in the public domain. Okay? But I'll tell you, that's what I did. I sent out a message to 5 million people, I asked for volunteers, 250 said yes, I sent 250 a copy of the manuscript, 60 actually returned it with comments, and great, great comments, literally hundreds of great comments. The third time that I tapped the crowd is when the book is quote unquote done, and at this point, I send another message to my five million closest friends and I ask them if they would like to review the book. Now, not edit the book, review it. Just send me their information, their blog name, their blog address, uh, a description of their blog, an approximate page count, their page views per month. And so I sent this out to another five million people and about a thousand people said yes. And so I sent the PDF of the book to a thousand people this way. So all in all, um, I probably sent the book to 1,500 people before it was available. Uh, and I, I tell you what, um, it takes trust. You have to trust people that they're not going to pirate it. You also have to trust people that um, they're, they're going to be ethical, that they're going to do right by you and actually give you good feedback. Uh, and I have found this to be completely true, completely and utterly true. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind that this process makes my book much, much better. And then there's a bonus at the end. So the way Amazon works is people cannot post a review to your book until the book is actually for sale. So the book can be pre-orderable for weeks, but you can't enter a review on the book until it's actually for sale. Because if you think about it, if you can only pre-order the book, how could you possibly review it? Because you haven't gotten it yet, right? So the moment that a book turns on and is actually orderable, that's when you can post the review. So that occurred for me at midnight on December 9th, or you know, early December 10th. So at 7 p.m. on December 9th, I sent an email to these 1,000 or 1,500 of my closest friends who I knew read the book, and I said, this book is going live in five hours. That's the first time you can post a review. It would be very, very beneficial to me if there were lots of great reviews right out the gate. So I go to sleep, and the next morning I wake up and there are 50 five-star reviews. So in roughly seven hours, 50 people posted great reviews. And shall I just say that that trend has continued. So that is a great thing and it was because I trusted these 1,000 to 1,500 people. You know, a couple days ago, if you looked at my reviews, there are 229 reviews of which 199 are five-star, uh, 27 are four-star, and three are three-star. To put it mildly, uh, this is a rather good score. And this was done, I, this is not guy 
having 200 fake accounts. This is not guy paying anybody to write a review. This is people who just love the book. But a lot of this is because I trusted people early and I got them to read the book. So tap the crowd. Number seven is you have to hire a copy editor. The probability that you are a good writer and a good copy editor is zero. <laughs> zero. It's just not true. Okay, so I'll tell you a little story. With Ape, I had 10 friends, very smart people, literary people, review the book. Give me all the errors you can. Then, as you heard, I sent it to 250 people, 60 sent it back. So another 60 people tested it. There are two authors to Ape, myself and Sean Welch. We also read the book about 10 times. We read it on paper, we read it on tablets, we read it on computers, we read it every single way because every way you read it, you see different kinds of errors, okay? So these 72 people read it literally hundreds of times. So I think as I'm about to turn in the manuscript to my copy editor, I'm expecting this email in a couple of days where the copy editor says, Guy, for the first time in the history of my life, first time really in the history of printed word, this is a manuscript that's perfect. There are no errors in this manuscript. I cannot believe it. I've been a copy editor for 25 years. I've never seen anything like this. And I'm waiting for that email. Actually, I'm still waiting for that email. <laughs> So finally a week goes by, she sends me back the corrected manuscript, and before I even open it, I say, you know, so tell me, um, on a scale of 1 to 10, where 10 is a perfect book, no errors whatsoever, and 1 is it's a piece of crap, you don't even want to open it, what was 8? And she says, guy, it was, a, it was an 8. I said, well, how many 8s do you ever get? She goes, I never get an 8. I said, what is your usual count on a book? you know, on one to ten. She says two. <laughs> Usually I get twos and threes. Yours was an eight. Remarkable. Never seen anything like it. So I said, okay, so I'm, uh, so I'm still like, well, how come you didn't send me this letter? There's no mistakes, right? So then I said, all right, so, you know, tell me. Tell me. How many errors were there in it? I just want to know. I'm just curious. And I'm thinking she's going to say 50. Maybe 100. Worst case, okay? So she tells me 2,800. <laughs> and I say, okay, so let's just, first of all, how are you counting? So if, if, <laughs> so if, if, you, if you turn on track changes in Word, and let's say a word was transposed, it was out of order. So you, you, know, you take one word and you put it in another place. Word counts that as two mistakes, right? Not one. Even though you're just flipping the order, that's two mistakes. She says, yes, that's true. So it's okay. Considering that, how word is counting errors, how many errors were there truly? And she says, 1,400 mistakes. So 1,400 mistakes. And you know, we, we even discovered some more after shipping. So um, you need to hire a copy editor. One of the most obvious signs that you self-published the book and didn't do it professionally is the lack of copy editing. Copy editing a book, uh, my book has about 384 pages as a paperback. Uh, that costs about $1,000. You need to spend that $1,000. That's the, the worst $1,000 you can save if you publish a book. Okay, spend that $1,000. Uh, number eight, you also need to hire a cover designer. Okay, the odds that you are a good writer and a cover designer are also zero. <laughs> so the odds that you're a good cover designer and a good author and a good copy editor is roughly equal to the probability that you are standing on the bottom of a swimming pool in, on a sunny day and you get struck by lightning. Okay? It's just not going to happen. So let's talk about cover design. Uh, to do this, I will use an analogy of online dating. There are two kinds of online dating sites. One is eHarmony. At eHarmony, you fill out 29 dimensions of compatibility. Right? Because you're going to find your soulmate. You're going to be holding hands, sitting on that windswept beach with your parchment paper and your gold yeah. nib pen, writing, co authoring a novel together. This is your soulmate, you know? Kumbaya, hallelujah, everlasting love. Okay? That's what you do on eHarmony. At the other extreme of online dating, there is hot or not. <laughs> and hot or not, you see that woman's picture and you decide, hot or not. 
okay? And you either want to date her or not. And it takes roughly a second to make that decision, okay? So, guess which dating site describes cover design? It is not eHarmony. It is hot or not. This is the context in which your cover will be seen. Potential readers are not going to determine if you are compatible on 29 parameters. <laughs> They're not going to see if you have the same sensibilities about writing. They're just going to look at your cover and they're going to decide hot or not. That's it. You need to hire a cover designer because this is the context in which most decisions are made. Hot or not, not eHarmony. Hire a cover designer. Number nine, you need to test your ebook. This is something that, wow, I had no idea. I thought you upload it, you deploy it to various platforms, it came from Word, you know, every table's gonna work, every caption's gonna work, every, everything's gonna work, and come to find out that is not at all true. Not at all true. And so, if you just stuck to Kindle, you have to test on Kindle tablets, Kindle readers, and Kindle cloud readers. Those three alone could keep you busy for a very long time. You need to look at your book on every possible permutation of Kindle. Uh, one thing as an aside that I learned that just amazed me, many people have told me, Guy, you know, your book is only available as, uh, on a Kindle format. I don't have a Kindle tablet. I cannot read your book. And I think many people don't realize that there is a free Kindle app for Windows and Linux and Macintosh and iOS and Android. So you don't have to own a Kindle tablet at all to read a Kindle book. But many people believe you have to own a tablet. So if you're an author, you should know that. Uh, you will encounter that. So Kindle, you have to check it in all permutations. Then there's iBooks, and then there's Nook, and then there's Kobo. You have to test them on all things. Don't believe anybody who says you, you master it once, you deploy it, they're all perfect. Lots of funky things happen. <laughs> Uh, and number 10, as a self-published author, you have to learn to never give up. Because most people are going to tell you, just like as an entrepreneur, it's not necessary, it won't sell, no one will read it. Now this doesn't mean that every time somebody tells you you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. I wish it was that easy. But it's, if you do listen to those people and never write your book, then you will never know. So here are three classic books with three classic rejections. The first rejection says, we are not interested in science fiction which deals with negative utopias. They do not sell. That was the rejection for Stephen King's Carrie. His frantic and scrambled prose perfectly expressed the, the feverish travels of the beat generation. But is that enough? I don't think so. That's for Jack Kerouac on the road. And the best of all is, it is impossible to sell animal stories in the USA. <laughs> George Orwell, Animal Farm. Never give up. Never give up. And my last slide is, there is, a, to this day, some negativity and stigma attached with self-publishing. Self-publishing being something that, you know, an author did because he couldn't or she couldn't get a real publisher, right? So because you couldn't get a real publisher, you had to do it yourself. Hence, the Schmo Way by Joe Schmo came from Schmo Press. That's because Prentice and Penguin and Random House and Simon and & Schuster and McGraw-Hill didn't like it because it sucked. So Schmo had to publish the Schmo Way with Schmo Press. Um, and I think the time for that is over because I think that self-publishing is a more uh, artisanal way. Think about the other artisanal things in life, right? So artisanal means that you're a craftsman and you're controlling the process from beginning to end. If you're an artisanal brewer, you know, you're picking the grains and the hops and you're picking the kettle and you're picking the water and you're picking the process of making beer. And you're probably pasting the labels on the bottle that you designed yourself. Same thing with an artisanal winemaker. Same thing with an artisanal baker. It's, it's about the craft. Uh, think of your, if you're an independent film producer, you know, who goes up to an independent film producer and says to them, oh, so you uh, produce your own film, huh? That means you're a loser because you couldn't sell it to Sony Pictures. <laughs> and then do you go up to the artisanal baker and say, well, so uh, you opened up your own bakery because uh, you couldn't get a job at uh, making Twinkies. 
And do you go up to the artisanal brewer and say, oh, so you couldn't get a job at Anheuser-Busch, huh? So you had to start your own brewery. And do you go up to the artisanal winemaker and say, oh, so you couldn't get a job at Gallo, so you uh, had to make your own winery. You would not say that to any of these people. You should not say this to an author. So I want you to call this artisanal publishing from now on. And I want you to look at the Artisanal Hall of Fame. Some ex excellent examples of self-published books. Number one is John Audubon, Birds of America, sold by the plate, the color plate, self-published. Number two, Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman, self-published. Not only self-published, he set the type himself. That's artisanal publishing. And the third example, which may or may not qualify for great literature, but is a great example of self-publishing, is Fifty Shades of Grey. Fifty Shades of Grey, initially self-published. This is the Artisanal Hall of Fame. So, the name of the book is Ape, How to Publish a Book. Uh, there's a website called apethebook.com where all kinds of information and resources, there's royalty calculator, there's uh, a word template, there's an InDesign template, uh, there is a copy editor's test because as you hire a copy editor you need to know if you're talking to a good copy editor so we've, we have a page where it's full of errors, you send them the page, you let them copy edit, we show you the key so what the copy editor should have found. So we provide all sorts of resources. Also on Google Plus we have a, a writer, editor, designer for books community so that's at bit.ly slash ape community and that in half an hour, like I promised, is how to publish a book. Thank you very much.